Okay, that's it. Again, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, these last two sermons, including this one, uh, are Christopher's idea. While he was here, he gave me these ideas and uh, told me he'd like to hear a lesson on these. These are some of the things that he's been thinking about and uh, writing a lesson himself. So he asked me to go ahead and do one to see what I come up with. So this morning's lesson is called Perfect But Imperfect. Perfect but imperfect. You see, the world believes perfection is found in only a certain few things. The world believes perfection is found in wealth, how, well, how much wealth you can obtain, how much fame or fortune that you might have, possessions you might have gained along the way, things you might have, awards, awards you've received, maybe it's an Emmy, a Grammy, a, maybe it's a a gold medal from an Olympics, things like that. <clears throat> Power, how much authority you have over others. Basically, it's things that they acquire through their own efforts in some way or some fashion. You've heard it said in the world, you know, you need to unlock your full potential. There's uh, been lots of uh, workshops done on this, unlocking your potential. And there's even some uh, religious doctrine that's being taught in the world uh, <clears throat> that basically centers upon the same thing. Now also, you've heard probably the phrase, be all you can be. I even remember something like the, along that line dealing with the military at one time, I believe. The army, be all you can be. But the world thinks along those lines. And they believe that perfection is achieved through that line of thought. Be all you can be. Achieve all you can. It's all up to you. We even do that in school, don't we? We, we tell the students, you know, you can be anything you want to be. And that's true. That's true to a point because we want them to be encouraged to try and achieve. But is that where perfection lies? Is that the only place? In ancient times, uh, older men, the elders of the community would uh, often sit at the gates of the city. Uh, all the cities were gated back then, and they would greet visitors when they came into town. People knew that if they had a problem, uh, a legal issue of some kind, they could go to the gates, and uh, elders of the city would be there, and they would help them to solve the problem. You can find this mentioned in uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 31, 23, and uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 18. And even in Deuteronomy 21, 19 through 21 mentions the elders being at the gate. There's a story that's been circulated about <clears throat> one of these elders that was sitting at a gate. And a young man came by from another city. And he was looking for a place to live. And he walked up to the elder and he said, Good father, what a sort of people live in your city? And of course, the old man is wise, so he countered the question with a question. He says, well, what sort of people live in the city where you're from? And he said, wicked villains, liars, thieves, and uncaring fools. The old man shrugged his shoulders, and he said, well, you'll find those here too. And then along came another gentleman talked to the same elder and asked the same kind of question. He said, good father, what sort of people live in your city? And he counters with the same question, well, what, live, what kind live where you come from? And he says, gentlefolk, neighborly, wise and kind. The old man nodded and smiled and says, you'll find those here too. The point is that Everywhere we go, no matter where we go, people are generally the same. The world is full of all sorts of people. Some are going to be good, some are going to be bad. Yet we all fit one category that the Bible clearly states. And that category applies to everyone, whether they be good according to world standards or bad. And that is that we have all 
in some way, some fashion, fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all imperfect. It makes no difference what the world thinks about perfection. We all are under the category of being imperfect. When we are lost in the world and we don't know any better, when we're out in the world and we don't know the gospel, we don't know about God, <clears throat> we might believe in a God, and we might believe in good and evil and that sort of thing, but we're still in a condition of being lost. No person can be perfect on their own. Are you listening? No person, no matter who they are, can be perfect on their own. Some may think that they can, some may believe and teach that you can be, but the fact is that no one is perfect on their own. The scriptures clearly state that no man answers unto himself. We all answer to God, regardless. In Romans chapter 3 and verses 10 and 11 <clears throat> clearly puts this in perspective. The Lord says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. How much more clear can God make it? How could you misunderstand that? No matter how good you think you are, no matter how perfect you believe you've achieved perfection, you are still imperfect in the eyes of God. The world thinks that it can be righteous on its own is what the problem is. It believes that it can be made righteous on its own. Remember Cain in the beginning when he was worshiping God he chose to approach God and worship Him in the manner which he chose to do believing he could achieve the level that God wanted on his own doing his own thing. And what did God, did, God did not accept his sacrifice. Hence we have his anger, his frustration, and ultimately the murder of his brother. He tried to achieve that level of perfection on his own, and he could not do so. Romans, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25, clearly puts this in perspective as well. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. See, God's trying to teach man a lesson. He's trying to tell us, and He's always been trying to tell us, the scheme of redemption is the theme throughout the Bible, from the beginning to the end. It is God's attempt to help man to achieve that perfection that He wants and to be made righteous and so that He may obtain salvation. But men have a problem with listening to that. They continue to want to do so on their own. The point is that man must have help. He must have help to achieve that level of perfection or completeness, if you want, that God wants man to have. Many times that word perfection that's used in Scripture means to be complete. Without God in our lives, without salvation, without the righteousness of God, we are incomplete. Jesus came to earth to help man achieve this level of perfection that God wants man to have. Look at Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13. But go you and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Lord came here for the sole purpose to help man to become the sacrifice that man could not be on his own, to reach that level of perfection that God desires that man cannot achieve on his own, that he might be that sacrifice. He came here solely for that reason. The only way a man can become perfect is to come to the Lord and obey the gospel. 
turn to God, seek God, and obey Him. Look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 21. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 21. Make you perfect in every good work. Make you perfect. Make you complete. Make you what you're trying to achieve on your own. God helps you to do that. To do His will. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight, helping you to do the things He desires you to do. God will help you be perfect. God will help you achieve the righteousness and the goodness He wants you to have. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, is it hard to understand that? How could you misunderstand that unless you had some help? God works in you. God helps you to achieve the level of perfection that He wants you to have. See, man is called to perfection through the gospel. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. But the God of all grace who hath called us into His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect. Establish you, strengthen, settle you. Again, who makes us perfect? God does. See, the world is going about it the whole direction is wrong with the world. The whole process, the whole methodology the world professes and teaches and admonishes us to follow is taking us down the wrong direction. God is telling us very clearly He is the one who helps us reach that level of perfection. He is the one who makes us perfect. We do not achieve it on our own. As long as we remain faithful to God, He will maintain our perfection. Look in Jude 1 verse 24. He maintains that. It says, Now unto them that... It, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. God is able to keep me perfect. God is able to keep me in the condition he wants me to be in that I might be in his presence that I can achieve heaven in the final judgment. He keeps me there as long as I do what? He tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16, we remain faithful by following the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, this is how we maintain our relationship with God and the perfection that He wants. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So how do I achieve this perfection? How do I maintain this per perfection? I turn to the Lord, I obey the gospel, and I remain faithful to God's word, doing all the things which He has commanded me to do, and God makes me perfect. God keeps me in that state of perfection. I cannot do it on my own. I cannot be righteous on my own. The righteousness with which I achieve on my own is not the righteousness of God. God wants me to be righteous with His righteousness, not my own. The world, however, cannot understand this. This perfection of their own, they want to achieve. They need to an example. You see, the world looks to men naturally. The world is full of followers. That's what it ultimately boils down to. The world is full of followers and very few leaders. They need an example. As I've told you before, the world doesn't read the Bible as it ought. So that may, leaves it up to us to teach them the Bible by our example. And God knows this. God knew this would be the case. And that's why He tells us to be an example. To the world we must appear perfect. Hence the phrase perfect but imperfect to the world we must look perfect we know perfection is achieved in Christ we know we are made perfect in Christ 
But the world needs to look at us and see what? See the example of what they must do. The world must appear per to the world we must appear perfect so that we can be an example that they need. You see, the devil has blinded the world. He has made it so that the world can't see the truth. How many people have we tried to teach the gospel to? How many people have we that we love? There may be friends or relatives, and we tried to teach them about the gospel, tried to help them understand it. They just can't seem to get it in their minds so that they understand the truth. They want to continue to do whatever it is that they've been doing. Why is that? Well, the God tells you why. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting with verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, who is that as Satan, or the devil, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the, the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine into them. You see, it's not that their fault. It's not that they're not trying. We must work with, with the truth, with the gospel and prayer to help them see through the lies that they've been told. That's our job. You see, how do we do that? Well, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 tells us that we're a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praise of Him that called us out of darkness and into the kingdom of His marvelous light. We are the example. We are the ones that help them to see. They don't understand otherwise. We must be a living example. We must do as Paul says and present our bodies as a living sacrifice holy, dedicated to the Lord all our lives. And therefore we must maintain this perfection that God helps us to achieve and we must maintain that perfection when we're out in the world. Why? Because Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 tells us we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Who are those people? The world. The world is watching. What are we teaching? Are we demonstrating to them the perfection that God wants them to achieve? Or are we living as imperfected people the world recognizes as its own? See, the world is imperfect, though it thinks it's achieved perfection in some way. We must be the example the world sees. Paul explains it in Titus chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Titus chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Doing the things that you know God wants you to be doing. Living the life that God wants you to be living. In doctrine, that's in teaching. That's where that little Greek word come from, comes from called doctrinos. That's where, where we get the word teaching. In teaching. Showing uncorruptness. Showing a godly life, living godly in this present world, in gravity, in seriousness, and sincerity. Truly doing your best to teach the world what is right, what is wrong. Sound speech. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, we're told. That cannot be condemned, that cannot be categorized as part of the world. See, if we blend in with the world, it makes our teaching of none effect. It makes what we say meaningless. Because we will be associated with the world and say, well, so-and-so does the same thing, or they're doing the same thing, or they're saying the same thing. Then that makes us equal with the world, makes everything that we're trying vain and empty. And that's not what we want. And look at verse 8 of Titus. It says, that he, that is of the contrary part, that, that would be he who is out in the world, may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. That's how we're supposed to live. 
We are to live the perfection that God helps us to achieve. If we're not doing that, then we are not doing what God has called us to do. We're not living to the potential God wants us to live. And we're just like a truck stuck in the mud. We're making a lot of noise and throwing a lot of mud, but we're not getting anywhere. You've got to realize this and understand that being a child of God, being a Christian, is not a social club and it's not a game. It is a total life change, a life dedicated to God. See, part of our perfection is our maturity in Christ that enables us to bear the fruit by reaching the lost. We have to reach the lost. What greater way to reach the lost than be in contrast to what the world thinks? To stand out in the crowd, so to speak. If you blend in, you're just like one of everyone else. But if we stand out, we draw attention to ourselves, we draw attention to what we are doing, and in so doing, if we are living the righteous life we're supposed to be living, we bring glory to God by the way we live. That is part of our responsibility. Beloved, we must bear fruit. <clears throat> if you're not bearing fruit, if you're not saving souls, then you're not bearing fruit. God has told you clearly that the vine that doesn't bear fruit will be pruned away and thrown into the fire. That's not what you want. You want to go to heaven, so you must bear fruit. It's not hard to understand that. The fruit we bear are saved souls that follow what? Our example. They're following our example. Because they're not reading their Bible. Many of them aren't going to church. So what are they going to do right from the beginning? They're going to follow your example. Well, they're going to listen to you. And if they believe and obey the gospel, it will be because you've taught them. That part they will read and understand. But the rest of it, they're following your example. Are you in church every time the doors open? Are you living righteously in the world around you? What are they seeing in you day by day? They listen to us and they follow the gospel and they obey it, but then they learn by our example. Look in John chapter 15 and verse 2. John chapter 15 and verse 2. This is that verse I just mentioned to you. You have to bear fruit. You must, without question, bear fruit. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. You see, when we bear fruit and we're doing what God has told us to do, what did we just read a while ago? He works in us to do His will. God helps us when we are working for Him, when we're doing what's right. God helps us to bear the fruit. God helps us to serve Him. God helps us to achieve the perfection that He wants in us. But if we're not bearing fruit, then we're not doing His work. Obviously, we're not obeying the gospel. Obviously, we're falling back into the world. So he takes us away from the vine. And when the, the limb is severed from the vine, what happens? It dies. Ultimately, it's cast into the fire and is burned. Look at John chapter 15 and verse 8. You see, everything that we do must bring glory to God. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. So, in other words, if I want to claim to be a disciple, I want to be a follower of Christ, I want to say I'm a Christian, and I'm a member of the Lord's church, then I must be doing what? I must be bearing fruit. And if I'm not, I, I'm not what I think I am. 
the scriptures tell us that if we do that, that sort of thing, then we're lying to ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Not hard to understand that. We are imperfectly perfect. We are imperfect in the world. When we come to the Lord in an imperfect state, we cannot achieve perfection on our own. When we obey the gospel, God makes us perfect. And then to the world, we must carry that perfection out for them to be able to see us. The world must see us as the perfect children of God we're supposed to be. He must see us this way. We were once of the world, but now we are Christ. God has imparted His righteousness to us and helped us where we could not help ourselves. Remember, I've told you before, what you can do on your own, God encourages you to do. But what you can't do for yourself, He does for you when you are in Christ. This is how we maintain our perfection. A lot of people say, well, how do you do that? How do you maintain perfection? God tells you exactly how to maintain that perfection that we're supposed to have. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1, starting with verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Do you see that? Cleanseth. In the, in the Old English, in the King James, that ETH means it is an ongoing, continuing process. And we know this is true because in Hebrews, it tells us that Christ's blood is an eternal sacrifice. It does not end. It continues to be and remains that sacrifice on our behalf. And that is what he is talking about here. Look at verse 8 now. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We're lying to ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This means my imperfection, because I'm a man, can remain. And the only way I maintain that perfection is to continue to strive to obey the gospel in everything I say, in everything I do. But when I make a mistake, when I get trapped in the, uh, something, the devil, a snare the devil has laid for me, when I make a mistake, I can say I'm sorry. And I can ask for forgiveness and I can repent of that sin and God is there for me and will forgive me. That is how perfection is maintained. Verse 10 if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. We're going to make mistakes. And we're going to struggle. Because we're at war over our soul and for the souls of those that are around us. The devil doesn't want us to obey. The devil wants us to make mistakes. The devil wants us to falter. And sometimes he lays a pretty good crafty trick, doesn't he? and we make a mistake, or we get tired, we let the world oppress us, and we get depressed, and we get down, and we mess up. The point is, our perfection can be maintained when we make a mistake, and we can repent of that. The world does not have that option. Only the children of God have that option. You see, we also have another advantage the world doesn't have. We have each other. <coughs> We help each other maintain perfection. Not only God, is God there for us, but each other, we're there for one another. We have each other to support us and to pray for us. We help each other stay perfect. How? Look in James chapter 5 and verse 16. James chapter 5 and verse 16. Confess your faults one to another. 
Confess your faults one to another and pray for one for another. That you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We can pray for each other and help each other. We can encourage one another. We're told to come together, and when we come together, we're to edify and encourage one another, to lift one another up, we're to esteem one another greater than ourselves. All these things contribute to how we treat one another. My brother's important to me. I want to pray for him. If he comes to me and says, I need help, I need encouragement, uh, I'm struggling with this problem or that problem, then I can sit there and I can pray for him. I'm there for him because I want his perfection that he's achieved in Christ Jesus to remain. And by helping him, I help myself. Together we encourage one another. Together we maintain the perfection that God has helped us to achieve in Christ. See, this is the perfection the world does not understand. It cannot understand. Paul tells us the world does not have the ability to understand what we're talking about. So it's our job to model this perfection to the world. To teach the world that they might achieve the perfection that God wants them to have. The perfection the world seeks, has been seeking for all so long, is found in Christ and not in the world and not certainly not in man himself. So, perfect yet imperfect. We're only perfect in Christ. We're only perfect because God helps us to achieve that. We're only complete in Christ. When we're outside of the world and we die out in the world, we remain incomplete and imperfect. And we will be cast into outer darkness where all incompleteness is cast. We want to be perfect. We want to achieve perfection. We want to go to heaven. Beloved, it's in Christ. It's obeying the gospel and remaining faithful unto death. It's all there for us. And a God who loves you and has made it possible for you to be able, have the right to call him Father, to have, has, has enabled the scheme of redemption from before the foundation of the world, he knew what he would do, he has made Christ the sacrifice for you to help you achieve that perfection he wants you to have. If you're here this morning and you need to put your Lord on in baptism, now's your opportunity to do that, to become perfect in Christ. To be able to say, I know I'm going to heaven. My sins are forgiven. God loves me and has made it so. If you desire that or if you are a child of God and you have stumbled and fallen and you've lost that level of perfection He wants you to have, how's your opportunity to get that level of perfection back? Didn't we just read the scripture where we can pray one for another? Confess your faults? If you're here this morning and you need the prayers of the church, we're here for you. We love you. And we certainly want to help you go to heaven. That's what we're here for. To help one another and to help the world find the Savior that loves them. You're here this morning. Won't you come while we stand and sing number 600?